Okay, so it's about time for us to get started. Um, just before we start for today, a reminder that Monday we're not in classes, so Monday is a day off. Um, I'm not going to try and cheat and post an extra lecture to make on your own, so Monday's class is just straight up canceled. Where some of you have a lab Monday, our holiday, our surprise holiday on Monday does interfere with the lab schedule. I'm going to tell you if your lab section is on Monday, check Brightspace for your new lab schedule. There's been some juggling, so just check your schedule. But basically still plan on showing up for the lab every week, but not this Monday coming. Um, I think that's it. Is there any questions or anything? Okay, so last day we talked specifically about a wave on a string. The wave speed is the tension divided by the mass per unit length. Um, we often use this equation in conjunction with V equals F lambda, especially with what we're going to get started on today. And at the end of last class, we found a new way to write down that mass per unit length, so I put that in our summary there as well. So the very end of our last class, we started talking about energy for the wave on the string. And I quit halfway through a slide, so we'll pick up during that last half of the slide. So what we got to talking about last time was that if we wanted to find the total mechanical energy, we would sum the kinetic and the potential. We know that as long as we don't have any non-conservative or dissipative forces, that total mechanical energy will always be a constant. So it's a combination of kinetic and potential. If it's a constant, it means sometimes we'll have a mix of both kinetic and potential. Sometimes it will be all potential. Sometimes it will be all kinetic. And regardless, we'll always have the same total amount of energy. So we said that a legitimate way to write down the total energy was to write the, thank you, was to write the maximum kinetic energy, which is a half mv maximum squared. So this is a fair representation of a way to write down the total energy. Then we thought about our string. We looked in at a little tiny piece. We said it had a length of delta x and a mass of delta m. And we said when we have a pulse on a string, it's moving up and down with simple harmonic motion because we're talking about sinusoidal waves. We applied our expression for energy to get a half times the mass times V maximum squared. Then we dealt with mass and speed. We said that since mass per unit length mu is mass over length, then mass, our little bit of mass delta M, is our mass per unit length mu times however long this little bit is, and that has a length of delta X. So we filled that in for our delta M. Then we remembered that for something moving with simple harmonic motion, the maximum velocity is the amplitude times the angular frequency omega, where omega is 2 pi over the period, or 2 pi times the frequency. So that was where we wound up last day. This tells us about how much energy is transmitted by each piece of the string. Um, I'll just give that reminder that you're not allowed to take any photos or anything in class, so if you have your phones, just make sure they're flat on the desk, please. So it can be useful to talk about the total amount of energy delivered by a wave, and certainly that's important, but often the quantity we care about more is the power delivery, how much energy in how much time. Because if you have a lot of energy delivered, it matters if you get it in seconds or in days, right? Over days, your building is not going to fall down. Over seconds, a city is demolished. So let's look at the power define power, that has a symbol of a capital P typically, and power is the change in energy with respect to time, or the amount of energy over the amount of time. So that's d by dt, so the change with respect to time, of the energy we just wrote down, a half times mu, times delta x, times a, times omega, so if we look at each of those terms, a half is constant, that can come out front. Mu is a constant for our string, that can come out front. A squared is constant, that comes out front. Omega squared is constant, that comes out front. And we're left with change in position over change in time. Change in position over change in time, that's your wave speed.
So our expression for power becomes 1 half times mu times a squared times omega squared times b. So there's the power delivered by a traveling wave. Um, and this is for a wave on a string. So these are all quantities we can measure. We can find the linear mass density. We can measure the amplitude of the wave. We can measure the frequency and the wave speed. So this one is pretty useful. Okay, any questions? Okay. Yeah? Are you like calling that uh, formula like the power of a moving wave? Or is that yeah, power delivered by a traveling wave. Yeah. Probably what I would say. Okie dokie. So let's do an example with some numbers. Um, there's not much we can do that's very difficult here. Why don't we do an example where we're given some numbers and we'll calculate the power. So I'm going to go back to that geologist example because we had lots of numbers in that example. So we've got our rope, our shaft or our rope is 80 meters long. The rope is stretched by a, I think that was 20 kilograms in our last example. I must have dropped my decimal point. 20 kilogram box of rock samples attached at the bottom. The geologist at the bottom sends a pulse up that rope, so the wave starts to travel up. And our colleague is gonna send it with a frequency of two hertz. So two times every second is how fast he's shaken that rope. We found the wave speed to be 88.6 meters per second. Um, if the amplitude is five centimeters, so it just gives it a little pulse, how much power was delivered by that wave? So we'll write down our equation for power. One half times mu times a squared times omega squared times b. So the only little bit of work we have to do here is let's write down what our mu value is. To find mu, that's going to be the mass of the rope divided by the length of the rope. Amplitude, we just have to be a little bit careful here with this number. When we calculate power, it's going to be in watts, which is joules per second. That's an SI unit. We should convert our amplitude to meters. Okay, so we need to work in SI units for this problem. So our amplitude is 0.05 meters. Our omega, we're given our frequency, so we'll use that omega is equal to 2 times pi times f. And our wave speed we calculated in our prior example, 88.6 meters per second. So to calculate our power, we'll say 1 half times the mass of the string, 2 kilograms, divided by the length of the string, 80 meters, times the amplitude, 0 0.05 meters, squared times 2 times pi times our frequency of 2 hertz, Square that omega and then times our velocity, 88.6. I have to write tiny meters per second. Put all that through the calculator, we get a power of 0 0.437 watts. Okay. Any questions? It's pretty straightforward. So if you've downloaded the notes, or if you look at them after class, you'll see another homework question. In the homework questions, I give you a bunch of numbers and I ask you to solve for the amplitude. So it'll be the same equation, but instead of solving for P, you'll solve for A. Okay, so, so far, all of the waves we've looked at, um, you might remember when I opened up those simulations, all of the waves went out of an open window. We never talked about what happens when we get to the end of the string. So that's what we're going to talk about now. And I've got a couple of simulations kind of preloaded. So we're going to ask, when a wave comes down a string, we sort of have two options at the end that we're going to discuss. First of all, it can hit a fixed end. It can bang into a wall, something immovable. So that could happen. 
or it could hit an end that's allowed to move around. So we could hit a fixed end or a free end. Those are our two boundaries. So let's look at what happens when a wave hits a fixed end. So the pulse comes down. I only said one pulse at a time. Hits the clamp, turns upside down. Okay, so this is what happens when a wave hits a fixed end, a fixed barrier. It inverts, and we would call this, well, it reflects, it bounces back, but it also inverts. We would call this a phase shift of either pi radians or 180 degrees. So it completely inverts, it flips. Okay, what if we had the free end? So now our wave is going down, hits the end that's allowed to move. That one still reflects, still bounces back, but this one doesn't turn upside down. This one stays upright. So there's a difference in behavior depending on what it hits. So to get some notes on our picture, we've got our wave, comes down this way, it hits our fixed end, and it comes out upside down. So it reflects back this way. So when a wave hits an end, regardless of the kind of end, we do get a reflection. When we hit our fixed end, the wave inverts. And an inversion is represented as a pi radians or 180 degrees phase shift. For our free end, we still get the reflection. So our wave, our pulse comes in this way. It hits the free end. When it comes back, it's exactly the way it started. So this one remains upright and has a zero phase shift. When we ask what are the boundary conditions, this is what we mean. The boundary conditions mean what happens at the end. Okay, so if you were asked for what are the boundary conditions at a fixed end, you would say it reflects with a pi phase shift. Okay, so those are our boundary conditions. So let's explain that behavior a little bit. Why does it do that? So this is just a picture I grabbed from your textbook, and here I, I just wrote all the words that will talk about what we're going to say. So if we're thinking about what happens at our fixed boundary, so the pulse comes in, moves down the line, and it hits the boundary. So these are like step-by-step -step pictures of that. The pulse is coming in, coming closer, and then it finally hits the wall. So at this step is where our pulse encounters that fixed boundary. Let's take a Newton's Law approach to this. When we get to this point, our string, which has tension in it, is at the fixed boundary. The string pulls on the wall because that's what strings do. They pull on things. So the tension in the string exerts a force on the wall. Okay, so that's what's happening on the wall because of the string. If we come to Newton's third law, if the string pulls on the wall, then the wall pulls back on the string. So there's an equal and opposite force or a reaction force. So there's a force on the string. If we look at what's happening right here on this point, we have someone, someone being the wall, pulls down on the string. What happens when you pull down on a string is you make a pulse that points down. Right? Just like if you pull up on it, you make a pulse that points up. You pull down, it makes a pulse that points down. So that's where that inverted pulse comes from. So the wall pulls down. That results in an inverted wave. with that approach, that strategy, yeah? Uh, when the wave hits a wall, does it lose amplitude or does it stay the same? Oh, that's such a good question. So the question, if not everybody heard it, was when we hit this boundary, does the wave lose any of its amplitude? In real systems, 100% it does. 
Um, because in a real system, this is going to make those molecules of the wall vibrate a little bit. It's going to transfer some of the wave energy into whatever that barrier is. We're not going to talk about waves that do that, so eventually it would diminish over time and go to zero. We're going to stay with ideal situations with no losses. That's a good question, though. Okay, so there's what happens at our fixed boundary. Now let's get to our free boundary. So at our free boundary, our pulse comes in, just like it does for the fixed one. So that's my picture here. It's coming in, coming in. As soon as it hits that ring, so this barrier at the end that's free to move, it pulls up on this point. This point is allowed to move, so it moves up. Right? So it just lifts because the string pulls it up. So it lifts. And again, to go back to your question, it's going to lift without any friction. So we're not going to get any losses between the ring and the support. Well, after it gets to the maximum height, then what it's going to do is fall down. So the motion of our free barrier is to lift and come down. That creates an up, upright pulse. So it lifts and falls. <coughs> upright wave. Okay, yep. So the, the hoop never contacts the pole? Yeah, theoretically, no. So what would be the difference between that and just a free of the string? Like just a string itself? That wouldn't be a boundary, right? There's nothing to reflect off of because it's just a piece of string. This is a boundary because the string ends at this point. It's just at that end, it's allowed to move. But how does it reflect if it doesn't actually? Well, the string is tied onto the loop, and the loop is around the support, so the string pulls up on the loop, which then falls back down. Yeah, okay, so it's like we get a little washer or something at the end, and it's just allowed to rise and fall. Yeah, we're assuming the friction is zero, but it's still allowed to move. Okay, so we got that sorted out. What happens at the ends? So let's go back to our simulation again. Okay, so next we're going to look at, it started playing, I didn't want it to. What happens instead of having a single wave, what if we have two? Okay, because rarely there's just going to be a single pulse on a string. Most of the time in the world, think about water or sound or light. There's lots and lots and lots of waves coming together all the time. So what if we have two waves? And this is a picture of two waves coming in. Okay, so one comes from the left, one comes from the right. We see that they come together in the middle for a short time. The look of the wave changes a little bit. Then what's also kind of interesting is they just keep going. They pass as if they had never interacted. So that's kind of interesting. So what happens is that the waves do in fact interact for a short time, but then they can keep going. So this is what happens if we have two waves that are standing up. They don't have to both be pointing in the same direction. We could have one up and one down. Okay, still the same sort of idea. They still meet in the middle, they still do something, and then they still keep going. So this overall is called wave interference, and this is a behavior that's particular to waves. This doesn't happen with objects. Um, I can't put my cell phone and my marker in the same place, they just don't go together. But waves absolutely can be in the same place at the same time, um, and that overall behavior is called interference. So interference happens 
when two or more waves um, overlap or they come together, they're in the same place at the same time. At the point, at the position and the time when they're in the same place, we get a new wave, which is the sum of the individual waves. So the waves come together and they add up. That's called a superposition of waves. So two waves will add together. So if we have one wave coming in, this wave might have a height of y1, which depends on position and time. And then we would have a second wave, y2, which also depends on position and time. You would add them together to get a resultant or a superposition. So I'm going to do y with a scrub, subscript of r to refer to the, sup, the resultant wave, which is what you get when you add them together. That will depend on x and t, and it is the sum of y1 and y2. All good? So just the idea is you got two waves, same place, same time. They interfere or they sum up to make the new wave, which is called the resultant. Okay, next. The little videos I showed, um, they were both interference, they were both superposition, but they were a little different. So we say we have two kinds of interference. And the two kinds that we talk about are constructive. So we have two waves that point in the same direction, both upright or both upside down. When they come together, the resulting wave is bigger. Okay? So our constructive interference gives us waves that get bigger. Destructive interference happens when you have waves that are opposite in nature, so one is up and one is down. Those two waves come together, they still make a resultant, but that wave is a little smaller than at least one of the two waves. So our destructive interference makes smaller waves, constructive makes bigger waves. And then for destructive interference, we do have a special class. We can get perfect destructive interference when they completely cancel out. So the two waves are exactly opposite in height at the same time, and we get a flat string for the moment. Okay, any questions? So constructive makes them bigger, destructive makes them smaller, and perfect destructive is when it's completely canceled. Uh, does perfect destructive happen when both amplitudes are equal? Or is it the amplitudes would have to be equal, yeah. Yeah, two waves with equal amplitudes, yeah. Yes, that's a good insight. That's a good observation. So this is very momentary. In the next snapshot after this picture, we would have this upright wave, again moving here, and this inverted wave moving here. So it's only at this instant of time that it's perfectly flat. Then the waves keep going, just like it did on that simulation. So it's flat only very briefly. Yeah. Okay, so that's interference, that's the two kinds, and that's our definitions. So now let's have a look at a very special case, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time on this special case. People coming to this course from Physics 1021 will have seen this in the lab before, or if you've done Physics 1051 before, you'll have seen this in the lab. This is going to be experiment one. I think this is experiment one. Nobody's done experiment one yet, right? So part, some of you will do experiment one Thursday next week, and then the Monday, I have no idea, whatever Stephen came up with. So what I've got here, this is a string vibrator. So it's got a little metal tab at the end that vibrates up and down. So this thing is gonna move up and down. I've attached it to a long string. At the other end, I've got my string resting on top of a pulley and I'm hanging a 200 gram mass from it. So this mass is applying some weight that's causing a tension in the string. So I've definitely got tension in my string. This is going to be the source of our waves. So this is going to send little pulses over and over and over. They're going to keep happening. They're going to travel down the string. They're going to hit this end. This end is fixed. 
because it's hanging off the pulley, it's not free to move. So because it's a fixed end, the waves are going to reflect and they're going to turn upside down. So that's what's going to happen here. Plug it in and get it going. Okay, so people close to the front can probably hear that, but maybe not the people in the back. And I gotta say, it doesn't look like much. You can maybe see the string moving a little bit, but maybe not very much. Okay, so this is just kind of some random interference now. I've definitely got these waves. Looks to me right now like most of the interference is destructive. My waves aren't very big. Now I'm just gonna move this a little bit. Okay, so the interference is changing. I do not have a very good knack for this, but I am gonna do my best. I think this one is not so loud. Okay, so now this is kind of something new. I've still got the same behavior. I've got waves coming out of here, traveling down the string, hitting this end and coming back. But I've got some stuff happening. If I look at these points right here, there's no motion right there at all. Those are perfectly still. So at all times, um, what I'm looking at right here, for all of the times, the interference right here is perfect destructive because that string is not moving a bit. In between those places, I get a lot of motion. So there's definitely waves, the string is moving. I can tell because if I put my finger on it, it'll stop. Sometimes the string is up really high and sometimes it's down really low. I get lots and lots of motion right here. And overall, this looks like a wave pattern. It goes up and down like this. And it looks like it's not moving, even though the string is moving. So this pattern is called a standing wave pattern. This is what you get when you get incident waves and reflected waves interfering at just the right conditions. Okay, and just the right conditions is something we're going to be talking about. So for a couple of definitions we'll use, these places where it's not moving at all, that's called a node. So node refers to no motion. These places right here, they're referred to as the anti-nodes because that's where it moves the most. And this point would represent the amplitude of this standing wave. So we're going to focus now and spend a fair amount of time talking about these standing waves. And then you'll get to do this in the lab for your next experiment. Yep. Is there anything we should know with the weights? The moment of the weights? Um, well, the tension in the string affects the wave speed. And the wave speed is going to be coupled together with the frequency and the wavelength to help us get the right conditions. So at some point during our analysis, we're going to be using V equals the root tension divided by mass per unit length. And that tension will depend on the hanging weight. Because I noticed that the wave moves up and down. Oh, that's, um, that's just as I was adjusting the length of the string. So another parameter that's going to be really important is the length between the two fixed points. Yeah. And the stuff hanging down, that doesn't really impact the standing wave. Yeah, okay, lots of good questions today. Okay, so I think I won't write any notes here because we saw what happens and we're going to have lots of notes as we go. So here's a picture, and this is a time-lapse picture of what I just set up right here. So this is a time-lapse. It shows some various snapshots in time of a standing wave. So they just set it up with a strobe light, and they took some pictures. Um, and our pattern is called standing waves because it looks like the waves are standing still. And our standing waves is a superposition of an incident wave and a reflected wave, and they're traveling in opposite directions. And superposition means they're adding together. To draw a standing wave, and you're going to have to draw these all the time, you know, this is going to be a test question, no doubt. We know that at one moment, or before we turn anything on, our string is at its equilibrium position. So the equilibrium, the center of the motion, is just the flat line. So that's what we get when the frequency generator is turned off. There's no motion at all. At some point in time, the string will be at its maximum distance from equilibrium. So the wave will look like this. So that's what it looks like at one snapshot in time. 
That's our maximum wave right here. It's kind of hard to draw on that black and white picture. And then a little bit of time later, in particular, a half of a period later, the string is going to be down at its lowest point. Okay, so it moves from up here, moves down a bit, down a bit more, down a bit more, and eventually it gets to the other extreme. So this picture, the pink and the blue lines, this is how we draw standing waves. So we show the two extremes of the wave, and this is our picture of a standing wave. The features of our standing wave are the things we just talked about. So the wavelength is one full cycle. So there's a wavelength. Um, a typical thing you're going to have to do is look at a picture of a standing wave. You'll have some idea of the scale, and you'll have to figure out the wavelength from the picture and your size. Our places where the string wasn't moving at all, those are our nodes. So let's label those on the picture. So these dots are the nodes. So there's never any motion at the nodes. The string is always at the equilibrium position at those nodes. That's where we always have our destructive interference. And then we have our anti-nodes in between the two nodes where we get the maximum range of motion. So we label those with A's for anti-nodes. So N for node, no motion. A for anti-node, maximum motion, opposite of a node. Um, the positions of the anti-node, they also show us the amplitude of this standing wave, the farthest distance from the equilibrium. So we're going to get to those amplitudes as well. Okay, questions here? Okay, so let's just do a little tiny bit more with our definitions, and then we can move on a bit. So there's all of our pictures again, the things we said about the nodes. So our nodes don't move at all. On our picture, I'll highlight the nodes in blue, just like we did on the last picture. Node, 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 node. This is where we get destructive interference because it doesn't move at all. Something we might notice from our picture, and we'll go on to show this mathematically, is that the distance between any two nodes is a half of a wavelength. So if you look at any two nodes, they're a half of a wavelength apart. So if you wanted to find the wavelength of a standing wave, you could just measure the distance between any two nodes, double it, there's your wavelength. Our anti-nodes, they're the place where we have the maximum motion. So let's label those in pink. The anti-nodes are where we get our maximum constructive interference. Anti-nodes are also separated by half of a wavelength. Okay, so distance between any two nodes or any two half no anti-nodes is a half of a wavelength. And then the last thing we might notice is that the distance between a node and an anti-node, that's a quarter of a wavelength. Good. Sometimes it's good to see these things on a picture before we worry about them with equations. So let's switch to a video that I guess lots of people have seen if you did high school physics. So it's about a minute long. It's probably worthwhile, even if you've seen it before. A Homer Bridge, Washington, opened only a few months ago, was built at a cost of over six million dollars. But misfortune overtakes the great structure. These are some of the most amazing pictures ever recorded by a newsreel. The actual collapse of the world's third largest suspension bridge.
explode and the suspension cables give way and plunge into the water below. Fortunately, the only casualties were a car stalled on the bridge and a dog. Okay, I don't think that was very fortunate at all. I feel for the poor dog. Anyway, so I've grabbed a still shot from that video right here. It's a little bit unclear. So here's just a snap from that video. What happened that day was that standing waves were generated on that bridge. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, a high school approach to explaining what happened was that the wind blew in puffs at just the right frequency and made it go, just like if you push a kid on a swing, they'll go. That's not really what happened. It was a steady wind that day. But a lot of things came together and made that standing wave hit. So we got the bridge vibrating. All of the support started to vibrate and it started kind of a torsional vibration where one end went up while the other end went down, even just a little bit. That pumped energy into the system, just like my stick wave generator here. And eventually those waves got bigger and bigger. We got to have resonance on that standing bridge. And then the amplitude of waves in resonance gets really, really big. Um, and eventually it gets so big that it just explodes, literally explodes. Um, this is why kind of structural engineering is so important. You know, people learned a lot from this. And now when engineers build bridges, there's always a lot of damping built into those structures because we don't want resonance to happen. Likewise with things like dance floors. Um, so if you're out at a club and you're dancing, people kind of get going. If you hit just the right beat and everybody's jumping up and down, that can be very problematic for a dance floor, right? So they build damping into dance floors so that things don't collapse. Anyway, that's all from chapter 14. Um, but our impact for right here is just to show that we had a standing wave on that bridge that day. Okay, so that sort of thing happens. Okay, so where does that take us? Let's just make sure you're sort of good from finding wavelengths from pictures. I don't think anybody's gonna to have too much trouble with this, but let's just do it before we move on to the analysis part. So let's look at this wave and find the wavelength of this wave. Okay, anybody wanna share what they think the wavelength is? One meter. One meter, people agree with one meter. Lots of nods and thumbs up. One meter is exactly correct. It's kind of good to see everybody's on board with that. So this kind of an idea, a couple of ways to do it. You could look at one wavelength. So one standing wave would go from here to here. There's one wavelength lambda. This position is 0 0.25 meters. This position is 1.25 meters. So lambda is 1.25 minus 0 0.25 equals one meter. Absolutely correct. An alternative way to do it would be to look and see, well, I start here at the amplitude, back to the amplitude, that's one wavelength, back to the amplitude again. This full thing is two wavelengths. I see from my picture that that equals two meters. So lambda equals one meter. Okay, some slight different ways to do it with the algebra. So as long as you can identify the wavelength from your picture, you should be all good. Sometimes you'll have a problem where you're given a picture of a standing wave on a string and you'll know how long the string is. You'll be expected to find wavelength from that sort of thing. Okay, so now on to the next bit. I think we should be able to get through this before we have to quit for today. What we wanna do is find an expression for our traveling wave. So prior to this, we found an expression y of x and t for a traveling wave on a string as a function of position and time. What we'd like to do is think about our two waves interfering and find the equation for that standing wave as a function of position and time. Um, these little simulations I'm going to use for the next while, they come from Dan Russell's website. Um, that's really interesting if you're kind of into sound and acoustics. He has a lot of really good stuff there. I can't remember where he's from. It might be Penn State. But anyway, Dan Russell is the person to look for. 
So what we've got here in this image, we've got a wave moving to the left on the same string, or wait, sorry, to the right. We've got a wave moving to the right, we've got a reflected wave coming and going to the left. The bottom here shows the superposition over time. So this is the addition of those two waves over time, and you see it looks like the standing wave. So our goal is to use the equations for these two waves, add them together, and get the equation for this wave. So that's what we're shooting for here. So let's get some notes on our picture. So our top wave is moving towards the right. I'm going to call this wave one. This is going to be the incident wave. So this is going to be y1 of x and t. My reflected wave is wave two. It's moving to the left. That's going to be y2 of x and t. We're going to say that these waves have the same amplitude, same frequency, same wavelength. Okay? So that's going to be a condition of our waves. Same amplitude, wavelength, and frequency, which means we have the same wave number and same angular frequency. So same parameters for both waves. Our superposition over time, we just saw it on the simulation. Sometimes it's perfectly flat. Sometimes it's at the maximum in one extreme. And sometimes it's at the maximum in the other extreme. So this, our standing wave, is our resultant. To find our standing wave, what we want to do is y r, y for the resultant, will be a function of x and t, which is going to be y1 plus y2. So now the last thing we'll do before we get to all of the algebra, we'll remember that for our standing wave, our nodes will always have a height of 0. y will always be 0. For our anti-nodes, those here in the middle, those will always have a y that can have the maximum or the minimum. We'll go back and forth between the positive and negative amplitude. So for our form for our first wave, y1, this is the form we're really familiar with, a times cosine kx minus omega t. Couple of things to note here, we've got a minus sign because it's traveling to the right. We could do this with a phase constant. Um, that would get a little bit tangly. So let's assume we have a phase constant of zero because we can always adjust our initial con conditions to make our phase constant zero. Okay, so we're gonna stick with a zero phase constant. Then Y2 is our reflected wave. That one's kind of interesting. So some things about our reflected wave. It's gonna have the same amplitude. It's going to have a cosine, same wavelength, same k, same frequency, same omega. First thing is that it's traveling to the left, so instead of kx minus omega t, it's kx plus omega t. And then the next thing we have to deal with is that when it reflects, it turns upside down. It's inverted compared to y1, so this one has to be negative. It's got to be negative. It's got to point in the opposite direction. If one is up, the other is down. If one is down, the other is up. So the y's have to be negative of each other. Okay, still good? So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add these two equations together, and we're going to use some trig identities to do that. So the trig identity in particular that we're going to use is that cosine of alpha plus or minus beta is cosine alpha cosine beta minus plus sine alpha sine beta. I don't expect you to remember this kind of a trig identity. Um, this is what appendices are for. I do expect you to remember that cosine squared beta plus sine squared beta is 1. Um, that's probably not one I would give you during a test. Kind of That's something you should remember, just like tan is sine over cosine. So that's kind of the basics. This one, I would always give you this one on a test because 
because I would never be able to remember it. So in our equations, we have cosine of kx either plus or minus omega t. So right off the bat, I'm going to say that my alpha is equal to kx and my beta is equal to omega t. So I've decided what alpha and beta are. Now I'm going to apply my identity and see what I get for my answer. So my resultant is going to be A times the cosine of alpha minus beta. Subtract A inside the cosine of alpha plus beta. First thing I'm going to do is just take my A's outside. Okay, so I filled in my alpha and beta for kx and omega t, and I just hauled my a outside so that when things start to cancel, I don't have to worry about where that a went. So now let me apply my identity to each of these terms. So I've got cosine of alpha minus beta. That's going to equal cosine of alpha times cosine of beta. I've got a minus here, which gives me a plus between my cosines and my sines. So I've got plus sine alpha times sine beta. And then I've got a minus here. I'm going to use some brackets so I don't lose track of what's negative. I've got cosine alpha plus cosine beta. So I get cosine alpha times cosine beta. And then if I have a plus here, I get a minus between my sines and cosines. Sine alpha, sine beta. Close that bracket, close that bracket. So I've used my trig identity to expand my whole expression. When I look at this expression, I've got cosine alpha times cosine beta minus cosine alpha times cosine beta. Those two cancel out because they're equal and opposite. So now I've got A times sine alpha, sine beta, Minus and a minus gives me a plus. Sine alpha, sine beta. So I've got two of these. I get two times A times sine alpha times sine beta. So my resultant is equal to two times A times the sine of alpha, and I had said alpha was K times X, times sine of beta, and I said beta was omega times T. So here's an equation for our standing wave as a function of all positions and all times. Okay, let's make sure we understand what's what, what is what here in this picture. First of all, let's talk about sine kx. So sine kx, that's got our wavelength in it because k is 2 pi over lambda and it has x in it. So this little bit tells us what happens with regards to x. So there's our term that gives us the position dependence. Our sine omega t, that's got omega is 2 pi times the frequency, and our time t. So this one gives us our time dependence. And then this last little bit here, 2 times a is in front of everything. a refers to the amplitude of y1 or y2. So if we were looking at these waves here, that would be the amplitude of y1. That would be the amplitude of y2. When they line up perfectly and come together, the amplitude of the new wave is double the amplitude of the individual waves because they came together and added up. This is the amplitude of our standing wave. And I might call that ASW for amplitude of standing wave. So that's what we get when y1 and y2 line up perfectly and we get the maximum constructive interference. Um, you might also recognize that y is going to be the amplitude whenever this term is equal to 1 and this term is equal to 1. So when both these guys are 1, that's when y is equal to the amplitude. Okay, any questions? Oh my goodness, it's 12.50, sorry. Um, so we'll quit there and then we're back on Wednesday.